even though we've got this Dave is in space right now. So we will we'll press on. All right, here we go. Hello and welcome to the weekly space hangout for a Wednesday, September 21st, 2022. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we're going to be talking about Dart impacting next week, insight sensed some meteorites. Gravity has remained constant over the lifetime of the universe. Hopefully, if Dave returns, we'll get a review of the Veonis Vespera and the launch of the Korea Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter. There's a problem with James Webb, which we're probably going to go into, uh, and maybe more or less. Who knows? I don't know. Joining me this week, we've got Dr. Morgan Redberg. Morgan. Hey, Fraser. Has SLS launched yet? Uh, okay, 27th is the new date, right? So that's a week. Uh, of what month and what year? <laughs> <laughs> they they tanked it gently, like just today or yesterday. And and they only found a few leaks this time. So Very comforting. <laughs> nothing that would stop this thing from flying. Uh, I think this thing's going to fly. Because the like if they can't make it fly this time around, then they're going to have to wait into october maybe bold, even into words, november Fraser, bold I, words I, I come on i'm the guy who for the last month has said it's not gonna fly don't worry about it don't even wake up i didn't even wake up to watch the launch that's how confident i was that it wasn't gonna fly because they were flying really early anyway uh we've got the uh the the blank space that is dave dickinson um hello dave hopefully he'll be back and joining us for his first time on the show, we've got Dakota Tyler. Dakota, how's it going? Pretty good. Uh, I'm really excited to be here. Um, yeah, excited to get my get my first show. It was a right on. short notice. Yeah, I think um, I decided that I was going to come on today, yesterday or the day before. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, now fit so, right in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that kind of last minute flexibility is really the primary thing we're looking for here. Um, mm -hmm. So. For people who aren't familiar with you, uh, give us a bit of a brief introduction. Yeah, so I um, right now I'm a doctoral student at UCLA, the Astronomy and Astrophysics Department, and I study exoplanets, specifically demographics, um, like why we see the types of planets that we see, where we see them, um, and atmospheres a little bit, a little bit of the atmospheric evolution processes that go in shaping exoplanets. And I it was a former college football player. So I played football at the University of Kentucky before I um, transitioned to a career in astronomy and astrophysics. And yeah, I also really love to do science communication and just talk about this stuff and, and get people excited about, you know, the universe. So how did it feel seeing those, those new images from James Webb of the exoplanet atmosphere? There was that first one they released with showing the water vapor. There was the one more recently, they showed the carbon dioxide. How did that signal look compared to the stuff that you'd seen before from Spitzer and various ground-based observatories? Oh, it's on a, it's on another level, right? There's yeah. a clear, clear detection of water in the atmosphere of um, WASP-96b. And that's really, I mean, for me personally, that's really interesting because when I kind of got into astronomy, what drew me in was this idea of like, you know, countless exoplanets out there that may be Earth-like or may not be Earth-like. And obviously the exoplanets that James Webb um, was imaging there are not Earth-like at all or, you know, habitable or anything like that. But being able to detect these sort of uh, fundamental and important molecules in the atmosphere is the next step to being able to kind of constrain what we know about you know these various exoplanets so that was really cool to see that's awesome yeah yeah and it's like it, so only like two months into this like it's amazing yeah. to think 20 years of observations of exoplanets in their atmospheres uh, like who knows what we're going to see so it's, it's yeah, pretty amazing yeah. to see yeah yeah hopefully you'll bring those stories to us all right uh now before we get into the special guest she's waiting so patiently there um, we'll, we'll introduce her in a moment, um, but I want to give a huge shout out and thanks to our good friends of the Weekly Space Hangout Brew. They are our friends, our fans, our executive producers. They call the shots. We do what they say. So if you want to join that elite group, go to wshcrew.space and they will give you the hookup and you will be able to really just decide which guests show up on the show. Uh, 
all kinds of ultimate cosmic powers. You definitely want to join that community. All right. Uh, joining us this week, our very special guest, Dr. Moy McTeer. Moya. Hi, Freezer. <laughs> I beat you to it. Happy Welcome. fall. <laughs> Welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank now, you. Welcome back, you mean. Welcome, welcome back to the show. But you are not in panelist mode. You are in special guest mode. And why is that? Oh, I am in today's hot seat because I wrote a book. And you had been threatening to write a book. And we we didn't believe that you would follow through with it. We thought just another one of Moya's just <laughs> random threats. And he's like, oh, no, I'll do it. I'll write yeah, I book. never do any of the things I say I'm going to do. And also, it's so rare for a weekly space hangout alum to write a book. Who who does that? Um, <laughs> Most. <laughs> Most, exactly. By the way, Dakota, if you haven't already written a book, it's now inevitable. Yeah, uh, you're you're yeah. definitely going to get your PhD, and then you're <laughs> definitely going to go on to write a book. Go on to write a book. Yeah, those two things are now locked in. Uh, the publishers are circling around like vultures. So um, <laughs> what is the book about, Moya? The book is, it, well, it has a great title. It's called The Milky Way, an autobiography of our galaxy, because it is the story of our Milky Way galaxy's life from its birth 13 plus billion years ago to whatever is going to happen to it when the entire universe ends. Uh, and also because I can't decide between folklore and astronomy, I never want to do that. Um, it also tells the story of human understanding of space from the myths that we told about it thousands of years to ago, and some people still do, uh, to the telescopes that we use now. And so what was your process in, in writing the book? Because like one of the things is the research process. Mm -hmm. And the hope is you're gonna find some information that is just not easily Googleable or listenable to during the weekly space hangout. <laughs> Where did you go for your information? Who did you talk to? I went to Columbia for it. Um, no, I, I mean, I <laughs> did my doctorate, PhD. Yeah. yeah, I did yeah, my I PhD in galaxies stuff. Um, and, and the Milky Way galaxy and the way that stars move around our home base. And so I knew a lot of the stuff that already I, I knew I wanted to put into this book. Uh, I had an outline of the chapters kind of roughly following chronologically through the Milky Way's life since it's chronicling its own story. And, uh, within each chapter, I had a list of points that I knew I wanted to hit. If there was anything I was unclear about that I, for some reason, didn't learn during my almost 10 years in school for astronomy, then I went to the papers themselves. Um, and I know how to read the papers because I grew up in that environment. So yeah, I uh, there actually wasn't much research that went into this book, aside from what I did in school. Most of the process was just trying to get into the voice, into the head of the person, of the personality of the Milky Way. <laughs> and what is the personality of the Milky Way? <laughs> very sassy, mm -hmm. very snarky, um, very overly confident with a chip on its shoulder, but also a soft spot for some things. Uh, the Milky Way loves its stars. The Milky Way has been in a long-term epic courtship with the Andromeda galaxy for billions of years. And kind of begrudgingly, the Milky Way also knows that humans are very small and insignificant in most ways, but it does appreciate the work that we've done to understand the universe around us. Um, and I mean, did you get a chance to interview some people who work on this? Um, no, that wasn't part of the research mm, okay. process right. either. Um, you're, you're poking at all of the all of the things that a uh, popular science writer is supposed to do well, to write books that I didn't well, do. I, yeah, I mean, I think, like, one of the things that I find really interesting, that when you write a book, it's more than you writing a book's worth of articles, because mm -hmm. you have to go deeper. You have to, it's almost like you're writing, it's like your doctorate, right? Like, like you got your PhD because you discovered something about the universe that nobody knew, and mm -hmm. this process of writing a book, you're bringing forth a perspective and and you're bringing new information that we're that we're not familiar with so so what i guess what takeaways do you think are you hoping that people will will bring with them as they think about what you've written yeah uh the biggest takeaway that i hope people get from it is a, a shift in their perspective a shift in their worldview. The, one of the biggest reasons I wrote this book from the perspective of the Milky Way looking down on us puny humans is that 
I think humans are too stuck in our own heads. I think we spend too much time thinking about our little issues as if they were a lot more important than they actually are. Um, and I wanted people through this book to tap into maybe a bit of that overview effect that astronauts talk mm. about when they come back. Uh, the the experience of being able to see all of the Earth at once, it really does change the way you look at the world. Um, most people aren't going to get it into space though so if they could get a bit of that from reading this book then i would be very happy and what is something about the milky way that most people don't know but you think they should know Ooh, well i did put a bit of my own research into this book my phd research was about the galactic habitable zone so where within the milky way specifically is what my research on but more generally where in a galaxy of this shape do you expect to find the conditions that are good for life like us? Uh, that's a big caveat there. We're looking for life like us. And uh, in one of my research papers, I looked at the motion of stars in the center of our galaxy in the spherical, more chaotically moving bulge of stars in the center of our galaxy. I simulated their orbits to figure out how often they would have close stellar encounters with each other and it's something like 80 percent four-fifths of stars have encounters within a thousand au every billion years that's really uh, close it's really close and it's really yeah. common i expected it to be less frequent than that but it wasn't <laughs> and so uh, when you're talking about galactic habitable zones the bulge probably isn't a great place to focus your search. So I included that in the book. Uh, but there, are, there's a lot of other stuff in here too, like the merger history of the Milky Way. I think a lot of people don't understand that stuff in space moves and interacts with each other. The idea of a galactic merger, I think is very far from most people's minds. So I made it pretty central to this book. It's central to the Milky Way's character that in the past it has merged with other galaxies and in the process, ripped those galaxies apart, cannibalizing their gas and dust so that it could make its own stars. Uh, right. But also, it's very much looking forward to the eventual merger that it will have with the Andromeda galaxy. Does it feel bad about that? Does it feel bad about gobbling up those baby galaxies and it does. tearing them to pieces? Yeah. yeah, it feels a lot of guilt and shame about that. Um, so in one thing I did in this book was turn black holes into a, a, a metaphor for mental health issues. Hmm. Um, so the black hole is the physical manifestation of your anxious thoughts, your depression, maybe uh, OCD tendencies, anything in there that might make you feel insecure or not like yourself as much. That's what black holes are. So that feeds into uh, the black hole, which the Milky Way calls Sarge. Uh, that's Sagittarius A star. And <laughs> yeah, it, that guilt from ripping apart other galaxies and the guilt from constantly making new stars knowing that they'll die that also feeds into uh the strength of sarge and what about the the far far future does milky way think about how it all comes to an end it does yes um uh, so one of the chapters in this book is called death where the milky way talks to us humans about the different ways that human scientists think the universe could end. Uh, because one conceit in this book is that the Milky Way will not divulge any of its secrets. Uh, it's only telling us things that human astron astronomers already know. So uh, it gives five different scenarios. I'm sure many of the people on this call know of them. The big freeze, the big bounce, the big crunch, uh, the big rip, even the big slurp. Um, and in between that one, I don't know. The big slurp is kind of a, a theoretical one where all of a sudden the universe could shift into a lo lower energy okay. state, typically right. with the Higgs field. Yeah. Right. Um, the vacuum energy death. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and in between explanations of those, the Milky Way also talks about how it would feel each one of them and most of them it's fine with the only one it really wouldn't like is the big rip because in that scenario, the Milky Way and Andromeda would get torn apart. So really, like, that's, that's all the Milky Way cares about. It wants right. to make stars, and it wants to marry Andromeda. <laughs> and, well, and it won't get a chance. The dark energy will carry Andromeda yes. away yeah. if, the, if the force of dark energy is, is increasing. Exactly. Now, now, one of the problems, of course, in writing a book about sp space and astronomy and science is that you're planting a flag on the timeline of discovery. 
and and the science just <laughs> moves on. Dave has a has a list of changes that that whenever we do the second version of the book, he's going to get right in there and and make the changes. Mm -hmm. Um, what uh, what have you got planned? What have you discovered since you finished the book? Yeah, um, a few things. So right after I published the book, we finally got a picture of Sagittarius A star. Right. Yes. Um, oh, and <laughs> that would have been helpful. I know. And there, there was a line that's still in the book where uh, the Milky Way makes fun of us because we took the picture of M87's black hole, but then it says, ha ha, but you didn't get a picture of mine. And now yeah. we have, so yeah. that's, that's wrong. Um, also all of the amazing JWST stuff came out after I turned in the last draft of the book. So that's not in here. Um, yeah. One of the best and worst things about science is that it progresses. And as a person who writes about science, it's a bit more of a curse than a blessing. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. I think there's there's no way to do it though because mm -hmm. I mean, I always joke about watching Cosmos, Carl Sagan Cosmos and and he's like there are these things we call quasars and they're the most incredibly bright things in the universe and we don't <laughs> know what they are. Maybe they're and he gets the right answer, but he also ooh, gets ooh. a bunch of wrong answer, a bunch of wrong answers. And you're like, "No, no, it's the black holes." Oh, it is, Carl. Yeah. It's kind of nice to see that, though, to see how we have absolutely learned in mm -hmm. such a small amount of time. There's proof. Yeah. I can see the uh, our our output is is crashing here. Pamela's working madly yeah. behind the scenes. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, you just can't you can't stop. You you have to write the you have to do your work. I, you know, I have I, I have plans for like a podcast series and I'm like, oh, but if I do it, all the science will be out of date. So maybe I wait <laughs> until this, the end of the universe. Yeah, right? This is the thing about content creation in general. If you're going to put out a book or a blog or a YouTube video, like it's going to be out of date <laughs> eventually. Yeah. You just have to hope that you're still creating content after it's out of date so you can correct yourself. But on the web, I can I can edit things. <laughs> I can update them. Okay, right? fine. Rub it in our faces, Fraser. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No trees. No trees were harmed in the... Actually, of course, in the in the book that, that Dave did, a few trees were, were harmed mm -hmm. in that. So so what's next? I, I'd be interested to know, have you got another book in you or did that crush all uh, interest in writing books? No, I had a blast writing this. It was so much fun. I got into my routine of going and getting my Dunkin' Ice coffee and making my blanket fort and <laughs> hiding away from the world while I pretended to be the galaxy. It was so much fun. So I would love to write another book, but in my contract for the first one, there was this line saying, I can't propose another book until six months after the first one comes out. Um, just I guess standard for first time authors because they want to see how this one does and they want write a first refusal for my next but I have some ideas um, yep. I would love to write an epistolary so uh, a novel written in the form of letters between the nine Greek muses talking about different ways that they've inspired humankind um, throughout our history so much bigger push on the mythology side of things yeah well it would be more of a history of science project uh, yeah. with the mythological lens of it being uh, through these characters' perspectives. Because I would love more information on your world building. Mm. I mean, that is the, I mean, I think that science fiction and fantasy needs a harsh dose of, <laughs> they need to get McTeared. And, yeah. <laughs> and, and I think, you know, like that's one of the things that's so wonderful is you bring this deep knowledge, but you also have the creativity and the, the enjoyment of the science fiction like you know you're willing to play along but at least yeah. provide some uh you know some science yeah I want, I want there to be a solid science foundation um i absolutely love doing the world building for the milky way imagining what the relationships between different galaxies would be like and maybe even just a, a small hint at some like galactic politics that was really fun to get at in this book yeah. yeah. Well, congratulations. I Thank couldn't you. be happier for you. Uh, so great that you got this uh, done and out of the way and you're ready for more, which yes. again, I find peculiar, a little unsettling, <laughs> but fine. You be you. Um, uh, but yeah.
Congratulations on getting through, and I hope the book sells a million copies. I believe that's how yeah, many, that's, that's that should what you could expect. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank that'll you. Be fine, awesome. <laughs> now, did you want to stick around, or do you want to head out? You are. I forgot to offer you this, but as our special guest, you get to enjoy the rest of your evening. That you can have the rest yes. of the night off. I I need to go eat dinner, so I'm going to go do good. that. <laughs> All right. Well, my pleasure to see you. Congratulations, thank and you. Uh, and good luck with everything that happens. And we'll see you in the future as a regular panelist, bringing a story Absolutely. that is may or may not be Milky Way related. <laughs> we'll see. Day, now, if people want to be on the book, oh, I forgot to mention, what else are you doing so people can follow your Ooh, stuff? Yes, uh, you can find me on go, on anything at Go Astro Mo. Uh, I have a podcast that's all about world building, like uh, you mentioned, Fraser, Fraser uh, called Exolore, E-X-O-L-O-R-E. And I host a show about mythology for PBS called Fate and Fabled. And speaking of things that need to be McTeared. Uh, this past year, I consulted a little bit with Disney on a movie that's coming out next year. I can finally tell you what it is. Uh, it's it's a movie called Wish, uh, all about a young girl who wishes upon a star. And I got to tell them how stars work so that they could make the magic in the movie. So you're the science advisor for a Disney movie. Yeah. Yes, that's I next am. That's level. That's I know. amazing. It's wow, really right cool. On. Thank all you. All right. Take care. We'll see you later. Bye. All right, Dave. Yes. Let's let's talk about um, the Vespera. You got a chance to try that yeah. that weird little telescope from Vionis. Yeah, Vionis uh, sent me. I'd reviewed their Stellina before, and they just released last week the Vespera, which is a smaller, more compact. It works off the same app. It's it's a smartphone control telescope. Like Unistellar is making one. Stellina is another one and you control it with your phone. There's no eyepiece on this thing. And it actually, uh, it, it, it does, it's very good for deep sky imaging, basically. It's stacking, but it automates the whole process of image stacking and broadcasting them to your phone and observing. And it's kind of interesting. I always think that you can actually get a lot of deep sky images from an urban area. We were still in downtown Norfolk at that point. So I tried it there and I took it out to a darker site. It's very small and lightweight, the Vespera, uh, unlike the uh, Unistellar or the uh, Stellina telescope, it's one arm. It's a 50 millimeter uh, objective, which is smaller than you know your your old 60 millimeter department store refractor telescopes. But it's uh, it's interesting. I think it did nearly as good as Stellina. I have a hmm. few uh, for for a much lower price. Now the thing is, it still comes in kind of pricey, about $2,500. Uh, the Unistellar Equinox. I mean, if I had $2,500 to throw away, I probably would get a Unistellar Equinox because there's just a few little factors with the, the Bionis telescope. It's a little slow. Uh, it's a little bulky. Like, you know, uh, I, I noticed I tried to, to image the moon with it and it went through all the focusing and aligning routines and then it rejected the observation. And I'm just thinking, you know, uh, I could be on the moon, uh, imaging the moon with like a small, like, swivel refractor in about 10 seconds so right that was kind a, of a, ironic but your iphone connected sitting in front of your dobsonian yeah yeah but it's uh but i really was amazed what it did when i got it up to darker sites i imaged the terrafid nebula and i mean imaged andromeda you could see some of the dust lanes and dark lanes wow. and that's only With a 50 about, millimeter yeah 50 millimeter about three or four minutes of when you have it on an object it just sits there and it starts stacking so you start seeing the longer you stay on the object and image, the more uh, detail you start seeing pulling out of it. I managed to get parts of the Veil Nebula, which I thought was kind of really putting it to its limits. That's uh, usually kind of, uh, it's in Cygnus. It's a long, uh, faint looping nebula that usually uh, I wouldn't go after otherwise. But from a dark site, you could pick out parts of the Veil Nebula, which I thought was kind of cool. Doesn't really do great for planets or the moon, ironically. It's right. Course. Yeah. And that's what I think you had written, like, don't use it for the planets or the or the moon. So, I yeah. mean, it's kind of a tricky size, right? That that when you think about the kinds of objects that you can shoot astrophotography with, you've got those big bright objects that you went after. You went after Andromeda, you went after yeah, the yeah. Trifid. I'm sure the rest of the stuff in Sagittarius is gonna look great. The yeah all the various globular clusters, et cetera. But do you think you would run out of targets with it? Um, yeah, it's, it does mostly bright um, messier objects and some of the brighter NGCs. 
and what was interesting and when they very first released the Stellina, and I actually told them it's like you need that you couldn't manually aim it like at a certain right ascension declination and i said well if there's a bright comet or something yeah. like that you 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 they just had what was in the database but they expanded it and now you can actually type in because that's how you need to do like i went after comet k2 pan stars uh 20 uh 2017 k2 pan stars about eighth magnitude right now i went after that and you could image it but you have to look up the coordinates no because comets move night to night yeah. too, so they're not going to be at the same right ascension declination i mean but, i got a chance to play with the stellina as well back at the same time that, that you did and yeah. it really does feel like magic yeah. that you take this white portal gun or portal <laughs> turret is what it looks the look, like the look on is amazing. It's like everybody yeah. said the same thing I said. It's like that's a telescope, and my, my wife was the same thing. And I was like, yeah. well, when it swivels open, you can kind of. But when it swivels closed, I will yeah. give them for design design aesthetics. Like they really went to make something that looked. I mean, longtime telescope users were kind of scratching their heads. When yeah, they first saw it. and and you just set the thing up and open up the app on your phone, and it just it just it plates it looks around the sky, plate solves, figures out where it is, knows what it's looking at, and now yeah. you just pointed at objects and it just starts taking pictures. That experience yeah. is so much better than working with a with a traditional the, telescope where you have to polar align it and the, the pointing is super accurate on it. That's what I, I will give it that yeah. it's in an arc minute, you know, for an amateur scope. That's and like how can that technology have not made its way into the other telescopes? Because like I want that balance. I want, I want to have like, I want to be able to pick and choose the telescope that I want, but I want that level of automation. Cause otherwise, you know, you invite a bunch of friends over and you're like, Saturn's up, let's take a look at it. Yeah. And yeah. then they're inside drinking wine and you're like, just a second, just a second. <laughs> I'm just, I just got a polar line it. Hold on. It's almost there. Yeah, and then yeah, like, yeah. they're all like, well, that was Every, fun. Fraser. See you later. No, just Every, come back. Come back. Every you star know. party you hear people like, yeah, having to go and troubleshoot yeah. their equipment or realign their scope. Or, yeah, you know, you have in the problem. morning, you know, when, my wife, when, you come into bed, nah, I'm going to polar align it. I'll get it. When, when the telescope aims at the ground, you know, you have a problem. So, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. This takes all yeah. that away. I even, I had my neighbor with the Stellina. Uh, he was very <clears throat> tech savvy, but knew nothing about astronomy. And I just let him loose with it. And he bonded his phone to it. And he was deep sky imaging. So yeah. the learning curve to go from, I know absolutely nothing about astronomy the deep sky imaging is is very uh, shallow. And so, like, what does one of these run? What, how much does this one cost? The Vespera is about twenty five hundred bucks, which again yeah. is, I think, is still. I think if they can get these under a thousand, yeah, uh, I think they they would be more popular. Uh, like for twenty five hundred bucks, that's a nice mount, a nice scope, a, a, a good high end DSLR. Yeah, uh, you got a good camera a, attached to it, a DSLR. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah that's but, tricky. But it, they're fun to play with. Yeah. This one's really yeah, I, lightweight. You could backpack with this one too. It can't yeah, it sounds great. Very cool. All right, Morgan. Yeah, let's talk about Dart. This kind of snuck up on me, but it's just this coming Monday. Uh, so Dart is an asteroid redirect test mission that's going to slam this tiny little impactor into a pretty small asteroid and basically see what happens. So this is asteroid Dimorphos, which is only about 120 meters across, but the uh, impactor is only about 600 kilograms. Uh, and this might sound pretty familiar. It might sound a lot like Deep Impact from uh, a couple decades ago. And it is, but the big difference here is Deep Impact, we were smashing into the asteroid to try to sort of understand what's inside it. Uh, with DART, the goal is to see if we can move it. And if projections sort of line up, we think that after this impact, we'll see a change in velocity for the asteroid of about 1%. Uh, and that will be enough to change its orbit by a measurable amount. Uh, and now you might say, you know, physics is physics. Like we should know exactly what, what's going to happen. Uh, but we don't because asteroids are weird things, especially small asteroids like these. They're probably more like rubble piles than they are single solid objects. And if you've ever tried to like, you know, throw a rock into a pile of sand, it just kind of won't. You know, there's a reason we use sandbags uh, in, in war because sand can very quickly uh, remove a lot of momentum. And so we think that DART's gonna hit it, it's gonna shift its 
velocity, which will shift its position, but we don't really know. Um, so that's sort of the sciencey reason for doing this. You know, the part, reason you should care, other than the fact that DART may one day save the Earth from, <laughs> you know, a terrifying impact, is because I, my suspicion is, is that this is just going to look bananas. Uh, so DART, like Deep Impact, has an onboard camera. Uh, obviously, it's like 20 years better. And it'll capture an image every second during the approach to the asteroid. And for the last two minutes of its approach, that asteroid will completely fill the field of view of, of the camera. Jeez. And by the time it, the last image it will, will release <laughs> will be about one second before impact at which point the entire field of view will be something like 10 centimeters. And, and then you know they're going to to create a a video that's going to be all of the frames that it sent back home of it just getting closer and closer and closer and then oh, smashing it's gonna into be it. Like the deep impact uh, that yeah. we had on the screen a, a minute ago, but just in exponentially more detail. Uh, now this is going to be moving fast, about six kilometers a second. So it's not going to be like, images we saw, say, of 67P, where there was just tons of intricate detail because the motion blur is going to be enormous. Uh, but thankfully, this isn't the only camera that we have to sort of see what's happening. Uh, so it's already dropped off a CubeSat that trails behind it by a couple minutes. And that CubeSat has both a wide angle and a narrow angle camera to take color photographs of what the impact looks like. Again, this very much follows the model we use for deep impact. And then, of course, we'll have all of the Earth telescopes looking this way, too. So James Webb will be looking here. Hubble will be looking here. Ground-based telescopes will be looking here. And they're going to be able to image and, more importantly, take the spectrum of the debris that's thrown out into space. And that's right. going to help us understand the composition of this little asteroid. Um, and it's really going to be a reveal. We don't even know what this thing looks like. Uh, you know, you see that our artist conception there looks suspiciously like some of the Kuiper Belt objects uh, that New Horizons has flown by. But because it's so small and so far away, it's just a point of light. Right. So it, it could very be well be like Ryugu or, or Bennu. Like it could just be this pile of charcoal rock. Right, exactly. And it won't yeah. be until about an hour before impact that we get the first pictures that show what this thing actually looks like and then in it goes bang and then we kind of wait to see to get enough observational points to compute a new orbital uh trajectory and that'll tell us basically did it move take that asteroid yeah so i think this is going to be super cool to see happen obviously yeah. nasa will be live with these pictures as they come in we should be getting the pictures from the main impactor, which are getting beamed straight back to Earth in pretty much real time. Uh, the follow-up images from the CubeSat will take weeks to months to download because it's going to be, you know, snap, 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 snap. And then, like New Horizons, will take a long time to sort of slowly downlink those high-resolution images. Uh, but the, the CubeSat is going to survive the flyby. Like, it's going to miss, right? Yes, correct. Yeah, uh, yeah. Whether it gets caught in debris from the ejection, we'll see. But the intention is, is that it will continue to be able to image the aftermath as it goes by. Right, right. It's, Very cool. Uh, like, like a cam. Yeah, I think they released that on September 11th. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's been yeah. slowly drifting apart to get a little separation for yeah. for the impact. And then and then it'll do its thing. Right on. That's, a, that's the Italian Space Agency's first deep space mission. Is that little CubeSat? <laughs> Was the CubeSat? Yeah. Yes. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. That's really interesting. When you when you talk about uh, the future implications, like um, you know, perturbing some asteroid that's going to perturb life on Earth, uh, but then you you know keep in mind that we don't know anything about these asteroids, and they all can be different in subtle ways. That whatever we were to learn about this impact may or may not um, really apply to you know some future yeah. asteroid and that which kind of just makes me think that we should be doing many many more of these uh yeah. sort of experiments to get a better idea of you know the composition of the average asteroid yeah well, and then I, you, try I, to, you try to scale up the like the dimensions here because you know 120 uh meter asteroid that's sort of in the chelyabinsk range 
where <laughs> it's going to make a bang and it's going to do damage on the surface, but it's not going to hurt anybody unless it falls into Times Square or something. Yeah. Um, you scale that up to something that could actually do damage on the surface, and then you know, volume scales to the cube of the size of the thing, and then the volume of your impactor and the mass of your impactor has to scale to the cube. And you go very quickly from something that weighs, you know, 600 kilograms to something that weighs like hundreds of thousands of kilograms. And, it, you know, so I think there's a feasibility question about whether we could realistically use this to to save Earth, even in its sort of we see it in a long way away, et cetera, et cetera. But it's mm -hmm. even if that's not the case, it's super important science, as, as you say, to understand the diversity of these bodies that we see in the solar system that we kind of assume are all similar. Yeah, the, there's a, so with the Artemis launch, which is gonna be launching in just a week, I promise, um, they've got the Nea Scout on board and this is gonna be deploying a solar sail and it's gonna be using the solar sail as a propulsion to reach an asteroid. I forget the exact jumble of numbers and letters that are the asteroid. <clears throat> and you've got a CubeSat with no propellant on board, just a solar sail, and it's going to be able to navigate this asteroid. You can imagine you release a thousand of those. Each one could go to multiple asteroids because once it's done with the one asteroid, it still has a full tank of fuel, the sun, and then could just move on to the next asteroid and the next one. And I think Dakota's exactly right. Like if we get to this point where every asteroid is its own special butterfly, then then you kind of you have to treat each one in its own separate way because it could be it could impact the earth in a, in a way that you weren't expecting and and cause damage in levels that you weren't prepared for and so it's almost a little more unsettling if these are totally different than Bennu and then and and Ryugu and they're also so different from Eros and they're also so different from Arakot 67p like everything is different then it just shows that we have to understand the whole solar system <clears throat> All right, Dakota, let's talk about uh, gravity constant after all these years. Okay, cool. So um, there was a new study by the DES team, that's the Dark Energy Survey, and they confirmed that gravity has been constant throughout the lifetime of the universe. And the reason why that's really important is because it's a further confirmation of Einstein's rel uh, theory of general relativity, which obviously is like revolutionized how we understand um, the universe, especially from what we understood about Newtonian gravity. So uh, they looked at a series of galaxies, 100 million to be exact, that are about 5 billion light years away. And they looked at that specific location because we know that the acceleration of the universe um, increased at about 5 billion light years ago. But for the first 8 billion or I'm sorry, 5 billion years ago. But for the first 8 billion years, the expansion rate was pretty constant. Um, of course, we, we attribute this accelerated expansion to dark energy, which we don't know what it is. Uh, but we have come up with these models called the uh, Lambda CDM models, which combine this dark energy term Lambda with dark matter, which we also don't really know what it is. <laughs> but we know that the models are really accurate. Um, we just don't, you know, we don't really know what's going on back there. And so a test like this to examine how gravity worked through gravitational lensing of galaxies, 100 million galaxies, about 5 billion uh, light years away, would perhaps, if we found some inconsistency in gravity, uh, allow us to write off, you know, this lambda CDM thing or the dark energy and, and dark matter and just say that gravity, you know, has changed over time. And perhaps that is why the expansion of the uh, universe has been accelerated. Do you have a question? No, so, right, yeah. So, like, this is this idea of the crisis in cosmology, right? That we measure mm -hmm. the expansion rate of the universe early on through the cosmic microwave background. You get one number, and then you measure it nowadays, and you get a different number. So, would if, if gravity wasn't constant, if gravity had been changing throughout the lifetime of the universe, would that fully explain the the crisis in cosmology would it would it solve it for people i'm not sure if it would solve it but it would to me i mean to me that is a bit more of a tangible answer or direction to go in than right. uh 
then injecting dark energy and saying, oh, well, there's actually this mysterious energy that is like accounting for the majority of what's in this universe that's causing it. to right. We don't know where, what it is, where it's coming from, why it happened, when it happened. So, well, I mean, solve it. No, but I think it would give us more of a, um, right. a uh, yeah, like a tangible kind of direction. to Right. That, so like, that's the, that like kind of can of worms that you open it to solve this problem and then yeah. everything yeah. else goes downhill. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like, sure, this works. But now, like, stars don't form at the same rate that mm -hmm. they're supposed to. And planets don't form. And galaxies don't hold together. And yeah. that's a bad, bad path to go down. And it's better to have the boogeyman of dark energy <laughs> than it is <laughs> an, an unknowable, un, unpredictable right. force of the universe. That's a bad place. That's, to that's really interesting. I'd never thought about that. That, that if the – that it, yes, indeed – if gravity is the force of gravity has been changing, that would perfectly explain why the it seems like the universe is speeding up because gravity is no longer holding these galaxies together as strong as it could, and now they're able to escape one another. But Morgan's exactly right that yeah. that not only that, but now galaxies shouldn't hold themselves together that's so more, well. That's Laura's next book, like that's like yeah. Sci-fi the wazoo, yeah, bad, bad yeah like, place. You know, you want to you 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 think Einstein was wrong? Fine. But here are the implications. Yeah. You know, Einstein will not go down without a fight. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, what the theory came out in 1915. So it's been over 100 years and we're still doing, you know, cutting edge experiments yeah. that are confirming. Um, and it also does make me feel a little bit more comfortable. Uh, you know, all this additional evidence that the laws of physics are not changing over time, because that's sort of like a staple, you know, that we that we rest on. The, the universe may die, but at least the laws of physics will remain constant throughout the entire... I mean, that's like, the bedrock of science. If that's not true, everything we know about physics yeah. is out the window. That's yeah. like, oh, man, yeah. you're never going to sleep again. So it really is kind of a monumental observation when you think about it, that they were measuring the gravitational influence of 100 million galaxies 5 billion years ago. Yeah, that's ridiculous. What, yeah. what, what? Do you know what instruments they were using to make these observations? Um, so they, it, what, it's a telescope that I'm not actually um, familiar with. The uh, Cerro Tololo, I may be butchering that pronunciation. Inter American Observatory. It's a four meter telescope. Um, the oh, Victor Blanco yeah. telescope. Yes, yeah, so this is an is a telescope that I that I use in my research. It's in the Atacama Desert. Yeah, down in Chile. Mm. Is that the one that's like a bundle of of t smaller telescopes mashed together? No, I don't think so. I don't think no, it's in a right. thinking of like the WASP. SPS the WASP, player. yeah, the WASP one. I think I think that area in Chile is where the Vera Rubin is going to be the, the LSST eventually. Mm. Yeah, the same yeah. observatory complex. Right, yeah. But I think this is a gravitational lensing study. Yeah. Um, and so you don't need any like fancy uh telescope you used to be able to see far enough back find those gravitational lenses and then you know turn the einstein crank and hope <laughs> you get the same answer I, I i still find it kind of so mind-bending that we don't know what dark matter is but we can use it as a telescope yeah. right yeah. <laughs> like, like there it is you're looking at this picture right now from mm -hmm. web you're yeah. seeing gravitational lenses in it and they're due to dark matter blobs of dark matter surrounding galaxy clusters mm -hmm. that are lensing that information it's it's kind of amazing um awesome. can you can were you able to see any exoplanets in that uh, in that data uh not that i'm aware of that would be um <laughs> but you know i mean who knows, maybe one too. day that's yeah. yeah well the gravitational lens you never know right like you get factors yeah, yeah. of like ten thousand. Yeah, well, you know, there was the possible there was the possible observation um, of an exoplanet in another galaxy that was uh, yeah yeah, yeah we which, that, you yeah. know we won't be confirmed for another eight, seventy or eighty years or something like that. Yeah. Uh, probably won't be around for that, but yeah, you never know. Yeah, that'd be amazing to to get that. Um, all right, uh, Dave, we've got uh, the launch of the Korea Pathfinder. Yeah, this happened earlier this summer, and I just thought it was an interesting one to bring up. It, it's uh, it's interesting because this is Korea's first lunar mission. This launched with SpaceX back in July. It's a, the Korean uh, Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter, and it's uh, going to be arriving at the moon by the end of this year. 
Uh, we also had the uh, the one that launched with Capstone that launched with the Electron rocket earlier. Actually, I, I was hearing Capstone was having some problems too. That was a different mission, but yes, kind of off and on. The the Capstone is tumbling right now. Yes, yes, because at, at first we thought it was lost, and they they regained uh, contact with it. But the Korean Lunar Pathfinder seems to be going uh, fine. And I will say something that was interesting when I wrote this article. You know. We all have this problem in spaceflight when you reach out to the Japanese Space Agency and the Chinese Space Agency and the Indian Space Agency, and they don't seem to want to talk to the press about anything. Uh, yep. Whereas the the Korean the Korean Space Agency was very enthusiastic to talk about this, and I actually got a lot of good quotes, and they seem to be really uh, so oh, kudos amazing. to them for that was the first yeah. time. Yeah, I've never made inroads. Uh, I, I know a lot of people in the Indian science and astronomy community. But and I've tried to talk to them. Do you have any contacts in the IRSRO that would? Be well, there's some people at JAXA. Um, yeah. James. JAXA, I... Oh, I forget his name, but yeah, there's some people, some some fairly famous people on Twitter who yeah. are on or working and with JAXA with the, that you can, with, you with can the, reach out with to. China, with China's space agency, we usually look at uh, like Andrew Jones and other people that are yeah. space flight observers that to try to divine exactly what they're doing because they don't. They don't seem to want to talk to the Western press that much, but no, I it's a uh, found a source for Chinese news that I, that's pretty good that I'm able to keep track of what's going on a lot better now. Yeah. It's tough with, because uh, you just essentially, you just rely on Andrew Jones to tell you what's happening with basically. the Chinese space agency. You, you look through his Twitter feed and see. Yeah. Going on. Um, no, but uh, this also has the very first uh, imager pole cam. It's got it's got the usual imagers on it for like uh, a magnetometer, and they're going to be looking for water ice and things like this. But pole cam was kind of interesting in that it's going to be the it's the first polarized light imager that's going to the moon, and they're going to be looking at uh, like pyroclastic like ancient pyroclastic flows and looking for water ice and things like that. But that stuck out to me too when I wrote it. It's like pole cam is kind of a unique instrument, but this is all a bunch of missions that are. Uh, they're coming up now that are returning to the moon, like you said, with Artemis, uh, if they get off the ground here eventually, and all the little uh, lunar CubeSats that they're sending up, and there's a bunch of other uh, smaller uh, private missions. Uh, Intuitive Machines wants to send landers. Astrobotics wants to send landers. And uh, it, there's there's really a whole bunch of lunar missions coming up, but this is one of the first ones to depart hmm. this new generation. That's really cool. All right, we've got a little bit of time left. Morgan, let's talk about uh, Insight sensing a bunch of meteorite impacts. Yeah, this on. is a, a pretty short story, and it's it's very cool. So Insight has, uh, for the first time, detected the signatures of impacts on the on, on the Martian surface uh, thanks to its seismometer. Um, and so, you know, as these uh, meteoroids come down through the atmosphere uh, and smack into the ground, they create Earth quakes or Mars quakes around magnitude two that um, Insight's able to pick up. What's even cooler is, is that it's picked up the sonic signatures of these meteors uh, coming in through the atmosphere as well. So you think about wow. the sonic boom that happens. Uh, one of these happened to be close enough to it that it could actually pick up those disturbances transmitted through the atmosphere. And, and this is something that Martian researchers had been hoping that insight was able to detect, but it, for whatever reason, just like it wasn't working and they hadn't, well, they hadn't heard anything for most of the life of the mission thus far. Um, but finally they got these four detections and then they worked with the Mars reconnaissance orbiter to actually confirm these things. And so they could make guesses based on the seismic waves of where these things were. And then MRO came over with its wide angle context camera and seeked these things out and, and was able to locate them. And then it came back over with uh, the high rise, like, you know, ultra detail uh, imager and take these just beautiful uh, enhanced color photos of these, uh, these impacts. And, and this is actually really important stuff because the rate at which things hit planets um, in the solar system is the one and only way that we have to estimate the age of things in the solar system beyond the Earth and the Moon. If you have a rock, you can do uh, age dating on that rock. But if you don't have a piece of the thing you're looking at, all you can do is look at the surface, count craters, 
and estimate the age. And so the better we can understand the rate at which things in the solar system are being bombarded, the more accurately we can estimate their ages. And we've tended to just kind of assume that rate is relatively common throughout the solar system. Uh, but the more we can find specifics on one uh, object or another, uh, the more we can dial in. The sad news that kind of accompanied this is, is that Insight's probably on its last legs. Mm -hmm. It's been accumulating Martian regolith on its solar panels and that seeing the power really start to decline. Mm -hmm. And so probably in the foreseeable future, we're not going to have an instance like uh, Spirit or Opportunity because Insight is static, right? It can't move around. So it doesn't have the ability to sort of find good windy positions to shake off the dust. It's just kind of piling up. And so it's great that Insight was able to make these observations before the end comes, uh, because that end is probably sooner than we'd like to think. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's when you get the, like, I'm sure, I'm sure everyone is looking, looking at this right now is going, why don't they just get that dust off the uh off the solar panels and they i promise you air. yeah they've thought of that yeah, yeah is my answer to you <laughs> um all right well on that note i think it's time to, to wrap things up so uh morgan uh where can people find out more and uh what are you working on yeah well speaking of impacts in the solar system i just wrote a pretty nifty piece for eos uh about observations from messenger at mercury that we're looking to try to constrain the impact rate of things at Mercury. Uh, and it could be quite different than we see other places in the solar system. Uh, so that's just one of a number of, of cool articles that I've written in the last um, month or so for, for EOS. So you can check that over at eos.org and you can always follow up on me at morganrenberg.com. Dave. Uh, frequent contributor, Universe Today, Sky and Telescope, uh, author of the Universe Today's Ultimate Guide to Observing the Cosmos and the Backyard uh, Astronomer's Field Guide. And I'm currently working on trying to get over to Spain right now. Assuming Good luck. Get the, the visa status. I think we're going to have to loiter here in the U.S. Southeast for a time, Airbnbs or staying with friends or whatnot. But uh, uh, it'll happen. You know, we'll, you'll we'll, get there. We'll, we'll, we'll. Next time we talk to you, you'll be in Spain. Yes. Yes. And you'll have some good internet, some good Spanish internet. I want to. I want to bring a star. I want to, My evil plan is to have a place over there with a Starlink connection, so uh, we can actually, you know, just have. I'll be able to dedicated. lend you mine in like a month. Oh, it was yes. two weeks when the episode started. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> they don't even. They won't even let me sign up for my Starlink. All right, Dakota, where can people find out more, and what are you working on? Uh, yeah, so for starters, you can follow me on on socials, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Uh, DT Star Kid, been posting a lot on on TikTok recently. And uh, as I'm a PhD student, I actually have some observations coming up soon uh, for this a couple of transiting planets for a really young system, a system that's only about 20, 25 million years old. Which is again wow. maybe that's sounds cool. very old, but of course this is like the fetal stage in a cosmos. What are you doing the observations with? Um, near spec on Keck. So, okay. Yep. Yeah. Sure. We're looking, um, we're looking at the atmosphere to see if we can detect it being blown away uh, by the star. Cause this is one of the mechanisms that we believe helps or, you know, shapes the distribution of planets is that um, if you're close enough to your star, your atmosphere is going to get heated up um, just from stellar radiation. Right. And that can, escape the planet so is that like the the neptune the mini neptune gap yeah well so what we're looking at are going to be like sub saturn sub jovian sized planets and so it's a, a bit a bit larger than that neptune gap the what we call the radius gap but um this photo evaporation that's clearly happening in the case of a hot jupiter is one of the culprits that we suspect is responsible for the radius gap as well which, yeah. Um, yeah, separates super Earth and sub Neptune sized planets. All, all the mini Neptunes got turned into super Earths. Yeah, yeah, that's the idea. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, really interesting. Awesome and uh, fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome aboard and uh, your trial by fire. And uh, yeah, so definitely 
Uh, yeah. We've got links to all of your work in the show notes. So if people want to find out more, they definitely should. And uh, I'm sure we'll see you again in some combination in the coming months. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for uh, once again uh, hanging out with us for this hour. Thank you to our special guest, Moya. I hope she has had dinner now. I'm going to do the same. Um, thanks to all of the moderators in the chat. Thanks to Nancy for organizing all of this. Thanks to Pamela for engineering behind the scenes. And I'm sure she is really sick of, of the internet now, but uh, appreciate everyone uh, getting through this. So thanks for watching us on YouTube and Twitch, and we will see all of you next week. Thanks everyone.